how much does LDL cholesterol compared to metabolic health contribute to our overall health? And if we had to pick one, which one should we focus on? Welcome back to Metabolic Mind. I'm Dr. Brett Schur. Metabolic Mind is a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group where we explore the intersection of metabolic and mental health and metabolic therapies like ketogenic therapy as treatment for mental illness. Today, we're discussing a new study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that's generated a lot of buzz on social media. The study explores how modifiable risk factors like LDL cholesterol, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, smoking, and body mass index, how those contribute to the development of heart disease and the risk of dying early. The spoiler alert, first, it appears that metabolic health is a more predictive marker for heart disease and death than cholesterol. And second, there's debate about whether low rather than high LDL cholesterol is a concern for increased risk of dying prematurely. However, several details and nuances need addressing. So on the surface, it may seem like this doesn't have much to do with treating mental health disorders, but trust me, it does. You see, one of the main concerns with ketogenic therapy is its potential effect on lipids, specifically the potential for increasing ApoB or LDL cholesterol. However, the other main impact of ketogenic therapy is improved metabolic health, which decreases the risk of type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. So any discussion that helps put these two topics, metabolic health and lipids, into perspective can, can help sort of shape the discussion around ketogenic therapy as treatment for mental health and other neurologic disorders. But before we get into the details, please remember that our channel is for informational purposes only. We're not providing individual or group medical or healthcare advice or establishing a provider-patient relationship. Many of the interventions we discuss can have dramatic or potentially dangerous effects if done without proper supervision. Consult your healthcare provider before changing your lifestyle or your medications. Now let's get into the study details to see what you can take away from it. So first, the scope of the study was impressive. The researchers examined 112 cohort studies from 34 countries, including over 1.5 million people. It's a lot of studies to look through and a lot of people represented. But a quick reminder, these were observational cohort studies, not randomized controlled trials. So the studies examined associations between the cardiovascular disease or all-cause mortality and the modifiable risk factors. It's not designed to find cause and effect, but rather the weaker level of evidence for association. Okay, so what did they find? Well, first, it's interesting to note that the risk of cardiac disease and death from any cause was the highest in North America. It's probably not surprising given the known metabolic dysfunction and poor health of the average American, but for me, it's always depressing to see, but hopefully it's a wake-up call for everyone that we have to act together to stop this trend. Here's the graph getting a lot of the attention and controversy. As you can see, non-HDL cholesterol, which is a marker of LDL and remnant cholesterol particles, non-HDL cholesterol was associated with an increased risk for heart disease as it increased, with no increased risk at a lower levels. And that fits the common narrative. But look at the all-cause mortality. There was no association with increased risk at higher levels of non-HDL cholesterol because it crosses one, but there was an increased risk at lower levels. Now that's contrary to what most people would believe. So how can we interpret this finding? Does this mean that higher LDL cholesterol is protective or lower is harmful? Well, with this level of evidence, we can't conclude either of those. But a finding like this should cause us to pause and question the degree of risk for LDL on our mortality. Now, many may wonder why this doesn't prove low LDL is harmful and higher is better. So, so data of this low quality can't determine what's called reverse causality. So here's another example. Look at the body mass index graph. That shows an increased risk at higher and lower levels. So a so-called normal body mass index of 20 had an association with increased mortality. This is commonly explained by reverse causality. People with cancer, Alzheimer's disease, other forms of frailty tend to lose weight or be underweight. So this study can't differentiate the healthy normal weight individuals from sick individuals who maybe were overweight but became normal weight as they became ill. And the same thing could potentially happen with non-HDL cholesterol. As people become frail and chronically ill, their LDL may go down. But again, this study is associational and tells us nothing about these specifics, but instead raises a hypothesis we need to test further. So the non-HDL information is, is interesting. But here's what I think is the most important graph of this paper. This graph displays the hazard ratios for each risk factor, roughly meaning how much each risk factor impacted health risk. In other words, 
Not just is there a risk, but how much risk? Now, diabetes far and away showed the highest risk for cardiovascular disease and mortality at any age of diagnosis, and smoking was second. Well, what about LDL or non-HDL cholesterol? Well, a 38 milligram per deciliter increase in non-HDL cholesterol had a small increased risk for heart disease for those in their 50s and 60s, but no impact on all-cause mortality. If you look at the graph and compare the non-HDL cholesterol to the diabetes graph, as you can see, it's pretty staggering difference. And this isn't just a one-off finding. There was an analysis of the Women's Health Study published in JAMA in 2021, which reported similar findings. And in this study, type 2 diabetes had a hazard ratio of 10 with a lipoprotein insulin resistance markers of 6. LDL was 1.3 with ApoB being slightly higher at 1.8. So it wasn't that elevated ApoB had no increased risk, just paled in comparison to markers of metabolic health. So what are my take home points? First, metabolic health is key. If we want to lower our risk of cardiovascular disease or premature mortality individually or as a population, we need to focus first and foremost on our metabolic health. That doesn't mean we can ignore lipids or other cardiovascular risk markers like inflammation, but, but the degree of contribution appears to really tilt in favor of metabolic first. And that is something our current medical environment and dietary guidelines really need to be better. Second, we still need to acknowledge that cholesterol and LDL lipoproteins serve a purpose in our bodies and lowering them as much as possible may not be the ideal approach for everyone. We need to explore how to identify best those who will or will not benefit their overall health by lowering LDL. So if someone is using ketogenic therapy to treat a mental health or neurologic disorder and they improve their metabolic health, that should go a long way in helping their doctors and clinical team realize the degree of overall health improvement. It may be enough of a benefit to offset any other variables such as LDL that may get their doctor's attention. So if you wanna learn more about the safety and efficacy of treating mental health disorders with ketogenic therapy, please subscribe and watch our other videos at Metabolic Mind, a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group. And you can start with this one that looks more closely at the supposed cardiac risk of ketosis. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Brett Schur, and we'll see you here next time at Metabolic Mind.